Good evening, folks. I'm Chris Martin, reporting for the BBR News. Our top story tonight is a troubling case of economic problems coming out of Sierra Nevada's brewing company. Our reporter, Ryan Barber, has the story. Ryan? Thanks, Chris. Sierra Nevada, mostly known for its pale ale and IPA beer lines, may be brewing financial troubles rather than ales lately. This comes after a third quarter report from the company that paints a grim picture of sales in the past year, with profits dipping into the red despite craft beer consumption at an all-time high. The cause of the problems might surprise you. Paul Rudd, the lovable actor who caught an unlikely break in the poorly received Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers, has been a prominent drinker of Sierra Nevada's craft, going so far as to include it in many of his films. But after Marvel snagged the 49-year-old star for its cinematic universe to play Ant-Man, his beer drinking habits changed. Adopting an athletic build for his superhero persona, Rudd has had to cut drinking the calorically high product, moving to something craft beer fans might grimace at. Miller 64. And with all of this Miller imbibing, he's slowly but surely transforming into Owen Wilson. This beverage change from Rudd has left Sierra Nevada's unsold beer rising and profit margins falling. No word yet on whether the company will attempt to get Rudd to reconsider working on his physique, but one thing's clear. It'll be difficult to sway Rudd from the giant dollar sign bag of cash that Disney is offering him. Reporting from Sierra Nevada's soon-to-be defunct North Carolina facility, Ryan Barber for BBR News. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Ryan. Troubling, troubling news. Blood and Black Rum Podcast presents Ant-Man and the Wasp. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Rum Podcast. I'm Ryan from ColdSploitation.com and I'm joined by my co-host Martin. How's it going? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Sitting here in a <laughs> stifling hot room, burping up beer. <laughs> um, you know, it's becoming more and more as this heat wave is just continuing on. And the heat wave around here is 90 degrees mm. in good old upstate New York. Grown accustomed to it. Well, it's gotten better too. I mean, previously there was a. Uh, it was like 95, 97. No, I know, because in my apartment it was it reached, 93 degrees reached in there. 100, and which I is was... pretty much unheard of for up here. It doesn't normally reach 100. That's a pretty lofty goal for the weather. It was 105 one day. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So. Uh... Well, I've gotten used to it because my apartment's generally now, because I'm too cheap to run the AC to like pump it through the entire thing, just keep my bedroom cool. Um, it's generally running around like 80, 83. It doesn't really bother me. Gotten used to it now. Yeah, that's not too bad. Not too bad. Compared to like, like the first week when we were getting, that was like just five minutes in, like, just like sweat pouring from, like kind of like airplane, you know, in the scene where Stryker's trying to land the plane and he's just like sweating and sweating and it yeah. just gets, you know, more and more profuse <laughs> just yeah. as Leslie Nielsen just like constantly <laughs> popping, like just want to let you know. We're all counting on you. <laughs> yes, I do know that. Yeah, that was that's, that's pretty much that was me. Yeah, that was me building a you know a desk at midnight with a friend, mm-hmm. just profusely sweating. You know what's good to do when it's really hot outside? Pop in to see a good old movie at the movie theater because movie theaters generally run pretty chilly now. And that's exactly what we did. It's kind of one of the benefits. It's kind of like you know. One of the benefits of going to a movie. You're like, That's you, right. When you see bars, like, we have AC. Yeah. Like, hey, stop on in. I feel like the we have AC thing and, and, t- and actually movie theaters in general doesn't really work that much anymore. Like, that used to be a telling thing in the, like, 70s and 80s. Like, we have ACs. Like, I'm there. You know, like, now it's like, oh, congratulations. 80% of the modern world has <laughs> AC now. Uh, it's, it's not as big of a deal anymore. But yeah, like I, I think – do you remember that Hey Arnold episode? Yes, I where love – Where they would go to – Which, which yeah. by the way, I love that because the fir- – I love that episode, the, that enti- the entire episode because the first episode is <laughs> Heat Wave. The second episode is Snow Day. Right. So it's just – Polar, polar you know, yeah, pun intended. Yes, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, it always like when we have a heat wave, it always reminds me of that hanging around the episode. Yeah, just b- getting a block of ice and yeah. putting it next to a. Fa- <laughs> I mean, I never tipped over an ice cream truck, but that's one of my favorite episodes. It's a good episode. I like because because the Jolly get... Ollie Man's one of the greatest Hey Arnold characters there is. We're getting a little off topic, but I think I like the um, Snow Day more because you get the mailman, the postman. I hate the snow. Yep. 
I hate the rain. Man, I sure do hate the snow. <laughs> That's pretty much, I pretty much quote that every time. So. I quote the Jolly Ollie good, Man all the time. time. When things get a little awkward, break out a, gotta get out of here. <laughs> That's what I do. All right, but what we did was, <laughs> for the heat wave, uh, we, we uh, snuck out we, on Sunday night. We saw Ant-Man and the Wasp. Or Ant-Man 2. Yeah, if you want to get just not so te- technical and call it what it is, a sequel. Um, cause as There's you know, any other films. That's right. We, as you know, we've seen uh, like pretty much all the Marvel movies that have come out recently. And reviewed yeah. them since Civil War. Yep. Bar- was, except Guardians bar- 2. Barring Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Um, and uh, so it's kind of become a staple of the show. And we've kind of become the Blood and Black Rum podcast, cult film show, and also do Marvel movies. And, and, and DC well, movies comics, when well, they're we'll out. Yeah, and movie. DC movies when they're out and we can make fun of them. But uh, we uh, we saw Ant Man and the Wasp, and, and w- one of the things that's interesting is that you never saw the original Ant Man. No, you did not catch that when it first came out. I did. I saw it at the drive-in on my pseudo honeymoon because it was right after our wedding. Well, really, it's been that long yeah. since the first. I it doesn't feel like it. Has yeah, been, been about uh, five years now. Four. Yeah, close yeah, clo- <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, we did. We we saw it on uh, our like our. It was like our casual honeymoon. What we didn't actually go on the, a trip. We went to a, on a, like a local trip, and we saw it at the drive-in. And uh, it was had a, a lot of sex. Uh, no, well, not not during the film. Why not? I, I know what I know what happened in Ant Man. So oh. not not during the film. But well, if you position yourself right in the car, you can watch and you know that's true. That's the, true. The, the missus gets to. <laughs> It's it true. Missed out on the film, and we all know that's not that's not that doesn't have to happen though. There are there are positions where that doesn't have to happen. No, I know. I'm just saying. You could always watch the film upside down, or you Blood could rushing come, to the you head. Could, you could come um, prepared for that and bring no, mirrors, get, bring mirrors, yeah, and just have them positioned around the car so it's like you never miss it. I've honestly only been to that drive-in once, and that was to see the. Great double feature of Harry Potter, like six and um, the, the Hangover. This isn't the driving that you're thinking of, though. Talking about the one that's out by Fort Plain oh. and Palatine Bridge. Well, why the hell would I drive all the way out to? No, I'm not talking about that one either. Actually, I forgot. No, this one's in Lake George. Oh, so fancy. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so there would be peop- too many people there. Yeah. Um, but so is with the uh, Ant Man and the Wasp. Um. You don't really need to see the original Ant Man. It's not not a huge uh, burden if you didn't see it. It's helpful for sure. But um, there are some points that I I miss with like some people. I think yeah, but at the same time, think about how long it's been since it uh, released, and I forgot those points too. So I'm sitting there watching pretty much in the same position as you. And the good thing about Ant Man and the Wasp is that it really goes over those points like um th- uh, with exposition throughout the film. So like you kind of get the exposition as the film goes along. And it also picks up after um, Civil War. No. Well, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, I, I it, picks, know, it picks for, up... For a, second, like, I thought, uh, for a second, I thought you meant Infinity War. I'm like, no, no. No, no it picks up after Civil War, uh, a little bit into the... into the After Civil War. So you do get some of the repercussions of... Two years after Civil yeah, War. Yeah, two years. What Ant-Man did during Civil War uh, as well. And that's kind of explained throughout mm-hmm. exposition because... I don't remember, and in during Civil War, did they actually go into any detail about like Ant Man getting in trouble for what he did? Did they, was that a thing that happened? I think he got captured. It. I can't. It's been so long since yeah, I, we've it, seen it Civil totally, War. It totally. I think he got. Yeah, I think at the end of that fight in at the airport in Germany, because um, I had trouble right, like, remembering. Right, yes, yes. And like, then, like and why he is, in... why he like why he's locked up? I'm mm. like, uh. I got my you. Only, yeah. I say because my only exposure to him is in Civil War. See, Which he's only got ten minutes, and I'm going, wow, Captain, wow, Captain America, and the, the, but that, but he, I remember him like growing super size, and that I think he gets like tired or knocked out, and then I think everyone kind of scatters, and he's kind of left there, and like the police kind of, yeah, that's right, they kind of swarmed in on him, and I think, like I said, been, I think that's, I think that's what I remember too. It's been I three, mean, it's, it's been three years now. It seems right to me, but. Uh, that's the thing about these Marvel movies now is that the Marvel movies were originally intended to not be that intricate, to not be as convoluted as comics. 
you know, you know, I mean, as having not, to follow them. And now they kind of are I mean, getting that point. I mean, they're not. It's it's not that they are. It's that there's such. I mean, there's so many films, and that like so many things that are are. The only thing that's making it intricate is the fact that they're all. There's so many of them connected now. You really do need like a previously on Dragon Ball Marvel. It would be you great know? if they did that because I do think that in some ways, when you have such a break between movies, like within with Ant Man and Ant Man and the Wasp, there is a long period between the two where you haven't even really seen Ant Man that much. Just have the intro. And- be like a, you know, don't have like a cold opening. Just have it be like a, because again, as we've said a thousand times on the show while we're viewing these Marvel films, they're modern day film serials. So like, you know, so like a Flash Gordon or whatever. So like have like a last, you know, last time we were dealing with Ant-Man, this is what was going on, you know. Um, Maybe they presume that the, the audience is going to do some research before, you know, like recapping or rem- before. Or remember. I mean, but yeah. that's asking a little bit too much from general moviegoers, I think. I, I think. I know. That- I, I would agree. Because if it's not, I would. Because for the most part, I would, I would say, yes, you should know and, you know, do your research. But like I said, it's been four years since the first Ant Man, three years since Civil War. So it's like. And even if you've been watching all the films up to. Infinity War now, which we have since Civil War, mm-hmm. you know, it not it's not that every film's connected directly to each other. So right. what's going on with the Guardians is different than what's going on with Spider Man and what's going on with Thor, but they're all leading to like a convergence. Yep. You know, so it'd be nice, it, like yeah, you're right to have like a kind of like okay, you know. Just just a, a slight recap. Doesn't even need to go into like all the events of Ant Man, but just to get us to this point. What the what are the main events that got us to this point? And in this case, you know, you do need to it would be very helpful to know at least Civil War. And then you do get the additional treat of knowing that this happens in between Civil War and Infinity War. Right before Infinity War. Right before Infinity War. So there is an additional um sort of like perk of knowing what happens after Ant-Man and the Wasp. So I think that, yeah, while you should do your research, there is that risk of doing research for the film. And then actually the film doesn't take place in the time frame that you thought it would. In in this case, most people assume that Ant-Man would not take place after Infinity War because that would really just really mess with the time frame of all the films. And you would, you would, have the uh, difficulty of explaining away certain things from Infinity War in its second movie that uh, you they're say, not ready to I do. I say, outside of the extra, you know, the bonus scene at the end of the movie, you might as well have had this f- film before Infinity War. The, think, only, the, 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 the only reason, like I said, the only reason that you don't cause, is because of that, that whole, you know, end credit scene where we get, you know, which shows... Why it doesn't? But overall, like it. I mean, if you if you didn't stick around for that, you'd be like, why the hell did this happen before? You know, show this before Infinity War. I think it does do an interesting thing though by not happening after, or or you know, not have happened before Infinity War. Um, you do get a sort of. I think it was Marvel's return to some like a lightheartedness uh, that it was looking for. After Infinity War, because when you see Infinity War, there is that grim darkness that DC has kind of gotten uh, pushback from. And so now you... Because it's not done well. No, I I understand. But I think Marvel was looking for one of those movies. And it was either going to be a Guardians or it was going to be an Ant-Man. Because those are the two that really tend towards comedy more so than action. But you couldn't do Guardians after Infinity War, though. That's the problem. With what exactly, because they're no, but they're, no, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying it doesn't make sense for them to do this because, like I said, the whole and we'll talk about that end credit scene, um, but in detail. So, spoiler alert, we'll talk about that when we get into the actual nitty gritty. But I'm not s- disagreeing with where it's put. But if you didn't see that, you'd be like, why the hell wasn't this before Infinity War? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But after seeing that, it's like okay, because outside you know outside of that kind of end credit scene it's kind of like um it takes place in its own little world bu- own little bubble and which i told you mike and this film entirely pointless 
And true. It, basically until that one scene. It's kind of like Batman v Superman where it's like this thing that's supposed to be so great and awesome. Batman and Superman fucking fighting each other, you know. Gonna be amazing. Entirely moot and pointless and what make, you know, and not just because it's bad and stupid. Even if it was a good film, it's like kind of like entirely pointless. Only so you have the end credit scene kind of like Justice League. True. Where you ha- and Amanda Waller and Suicide Squad. Leading up to a new thing. Yeah, Justice yeah. League and Suicide Squad. So I think that uh, for Ant-Man, the the pointless thing doesn't really come into play as much as what you, w- what you were saying with Batman v Superman. Because that really did seem like it squandered a lot of opportunity. Oh, it did. And, and things that people fans were really looking forward to just to get to Justice League. I mean, it doesn't feel like that. It doesn't really feel like it has a motivation to get to Infinity War because it's already happened. So it's really more so it's that... It's just here. Like it's, like it's, it's just... Here's it. Like, in a, it's like a total, like, we're branching off and, like, you know, like, yeah. Thor's doing his thing and it's leading to something. The Guardians are doing their thing. It's leading to something. Spider-Man's doing his thing, like, et cetera, et cetera. And then, like, all right, then here's... Ant Man kind of off to the side. The other really Com- compared to like all the rest of them, like he's off to the side. And when Infinity War two comes out, it all you know his part in They'll the story all come, yeah. come through. The other thing that really makes uh, Ant Man and the Wasp interesting is that it doesn't have any cameos from some of the other uh, superheroes that we generally get in other Marvel films. There's not like the appearance well, of like doctor strange or something like that that would and i would say too doctor strange and we talked about with infinity war his entire film though enjoyable we said is kind of came off as like oh this is all kind of pointless I, I mean it's there just to set up who doctor strange is and what he'll later kind of become in the infi- you know the storyline for infinity war but if, if you watch like the first film like well, compared to what they've been doing with Thor and all these other characters, kind of like, well, you didn't really pay too much attention with it. Ant- Ant-Man's like the worst offender because he's just literally, you know, in the Marvel Universe, I would say he's a B player. It's like, you know, if you were looking at DC, it's like you got Batman, sure. Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Green Lantern, and then it'd be like, here's Blue Beetle. People love Blue Beetle, but is he uh, like, you know, top flight DC hero? No, he's a bit, you know... To, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'd say Ant-Man's even, like, probably lower than a B player. I wouldn't even call him th- that, because you would expect someone to be, like, a B player to be maybe, like, uh, Captain Marvel, which they do have coming out as well. Yes. But that'd be, like... And even Doctor Strange is really, like, a B player. And Ant-Man is, like, lower than that. I would say, like, he's a C or D player. It was an interesting choice for them to produce an Ant-Man movie so quickly into the... I mean, I should say I, quickly, but... But, you know, within this universe that they gave him a single Well, because it's, I think, the film. whole quantum realm thing. Well, that's not really a realm. It's just quant- the whole quantum Physics, yeah. is going to come into, you know, play on how to beat Thanos. True. Um, but e- e- even the same thing with, like, Captain Marvel when she, you know, she shows up with her film. You know, because at, at the end of fin- Infinity War, you know, when Samuel L. Jackson gets obliterated from existence because of Thanos and he's, you know, paging out uh, Captain Marvel for S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, but even so, Doctor Str- like I said, Doctor Strange, I would say is kind of like a B player, but he's more, again, in the cr- after seeing Infinity War, he becomes an A player for what his role is. True. But the way, the fact that they tack him on so late into the thing, that's, that's one of the things I would say is kind of a negative. It'd be cool if they had like Doctor Strange kind of planned earlier on. Just because it, his importance to this, you know, the story the overall, overall Infinity Wars. you know, is very important. Plus, plus, they seem to skip a lot of his development. Yeah, because he goes, you know, like, and we argued in the first time uh, when we saw the film, you know, that we, th- like I said, thought it was good. Um, it's an origin story, and then he goes from being just, you know, surgeon and apprentice to Sorcerer Supreme, like, it seems like in a blink of an eye, like... And we don't really see that development. And by Infinity War, when we see, you know, well, Thor Ragnarok in his cameo and uh, his part in Infinity War, it's like... He's well, pretty much a master at that Yeah, point. so it's like, what, you know, I mean, and we know he's a genius and all, and he learns really quick, but I mean, it's like, it would be cool to see that, you know, kind of... Sure. 
Yeah. And I think, like, with Ant-Man, at least that was a little bit more portrayed. Like, in the, in the first Ant-Man, you do have a sense that he is new and then he learns his role. And now, you know, we've also gotten to see him a little bit, a li- I should say just a little bit, because in Civil War, he really has a bit part two. But you do get to see a little bit more of his progression from, you know, just learning how to use his suit and his quantum physic abilities to actually getting to be a little bit better at them in Ant-Man and the Wasp. So it is interesting. I, I, I'll, I'll, I think we should probably take a break before we really get into the whole, um, as you said, nitty gritty of Ant-Man and the Wasp. But um, really some interesting lead up to this film because most people knew in some way that Ant-Man and the Wasp had to have taken place before Infinity War or else it just really would have mitigated the impact of Infinity War and I wouldn't see Marvel wanting to do that. Can you imagine in the second part, I hope to God, in the second part of Infinity War, um, Captain America is the one that gets, you know, just drags him again like out of the van. He's like, Captain America, again, wow, again, wow. I can see it happening because they return to that joke again in in Ant-Man and the Wasp. So I could see that them maybe making that into sort of a returning joke where uh, he's very you know, adamant about Captain America becoming his friend. I think that might be something that they do return to. I mean, I think I, I think that would be funny. Like, they're about to fight Thanos, and Cap's like, hold on just a second, I got a secret weapon, and, like, dra- drags Paul Rudd. He's like, wow, 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 Captain America, wow. Who's that guy? Wow, you know. <laughs> it would be funny. Uh, let's take a break real quick to talk about the beer that we have on the show today. So the beer we have today is from Sierra Nevada, of all places. Uh, we so did, to be closed down. That, that's right. We did do a funny little news broadcast at the beginning of our show, but I'm sure that Sierra Nevada is doing just fine. I'm uh, sure they might send us a cease and desist, like stop spreading lies. That's that's right. Yeah, blatant lies. No, uh, we did the we did the intro because Paul Rudd really does have a lot of Sierra Nevada uh, on display when he's in his movies, especially in uh, Knocked Up, which. Yeah, he had a. I think he had a few scenes where he had a Sierra Nevada in that. So we've only that's always stuck with us. And uh, you know, he does. I I feel like he really does like a Sierra Nevada in in Ant Man and the Wasp and in the original Ant Man. He does not have a Sierra Nevada, and that's pretty disappointing to me. So I decided to write that little well, fake news broadcast. Well, he doesn't drink in those movies. True, he does not drink. Yes. So I think that would get you like an R now. To drink? I, I don't know about that. I don't know about an R, but. Yeah, I think it gets like an M now in like video. I know if there's tobacco use, it's an instant R. Um, that's not true either. But I mean, they want that. Uh, what is it? Uh, what's the new? What's that company that tries to do that? I can't remember what their name is, but they always advertise about trying to make films get an R rating for smoking. But I don't think that's I don't think that's in truth, a truth uh, truth campaign. Yeah, it must be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think that's in effect yet. And I think that's but pretty unreasonable. Smoking's but. so cool, though. Look at Sean Connery. And yeah. I, I think and it's Spike's, unreasonable. I think it's unreasonable up. because instead of doing that, you could just show all the dick people smoking and be like, I don't want to be like that guy. That guy's an asshole. <laughs> he smokes. No, nah, I'm just kidding. But anyway, we, uh, so we, we decided to patronize Sierra Nevada because they need our help. <laughs> uh, and we got their new beer. Um, that they've been marketing of late, which is the BFD. It's at least new around here. I don't know how long it's been. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel like it's, it's probably one of their like summer offerings because of the way that it's marketed, that it's a, uh, very drinkable, crushable beer. Yeah. Or it's just like their, uh, tall boy offer. Cause I, I wish it did come like in a six. I or believe 12 I have pack. seen it in a twelve, in a maybe a six. Maybe I have, a 12. I've only seen it I th- in Tall Boy. I think I have. And but by Tall Boy, I mean craft beer Tall Boy, nineteen point two <laughs> ounces. You know. Yeah, not the full, not the full Tall it's, Boy. It's, just, a, uh, it's a what four hundred fifty milliliters? Yeah, something like that, I guess. Uh, so the BFD, not BFG, because that I mean that'd be pretty fun, a funny name. But the BFD is the uh, beer for drink. Beer for drinking. Which is a very drinkable brew that uh, apparently they classify as a gold nail. I would not. I, I mean, it's hard to tell. I mean, perhaps it's golden when you pour it out. I didn't pour it out. I left it in the can as nature intended <laughs> uh, when, the, when you're drinking a tall boy. 
But uh, perhaps well, it's... Well, I was say, who does buy a tall boy and sits there like... Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Even if you buy like a Sierra Nevada torpedo tall boy, you're going like, hold on, let me pour this out. Yeah, I don't think most people do pour... I mean, most of the time when you buy a tall boy, you're like ready to drink it you're on in your store. Lawn, you're, on your, <laughs> you're on your lawnmower. Yeah, yeah. You've been mowing for four hours. You had to mow your yard, your mother's lawn, your aunt's lawn. You're like, I, I need, I'm the I'm pretty sure tall boys were invented for the ease of drinking. Just to crack it open when you get into a legal location. Well, you can't crush a glass, but you can crush a can. That's right, yeah. So, I don't think it's necessary to pour them out. But, uh, perhaps it's golden when you pour it out. However, yeah, I mean, I... I I'm just... It's because it's hoppy. I would say that so it's it, generally it, like a pale ale. That or session IPA. Yeah, or session is... IPA. I think that it, it has the uh, tendency to have... It, it it does have a hoppy character to it, although the hops, um, what you'll notice is that you get a, a in a hop note to it right away, and then it kind of fades off. It it backs away on your palate. But it is pretty hoppy, like that first, you know. First, it is, yeah. First sip's pretty hoppy, goes away, and then you get like a nice, slight malty sweetness, um, and it's very light, very crisp. I think it's really good. I I think that it's sig it's it's enough. Of a difference from their general pale ale to be another go-to beer from Sierra Nevada. Now, as you've heard us kind of criticize before with Sierra Nevada, they tend to do the same thing over and over again. Their beers, while probably changing up some of the, the recipes, some of the hops that are included, they tend to taste the same regardless of what the name is of the IPA that they're offering. Unless you're a connoisseur and know like all the different hop variations by... Because you've been a brewmaster for 25 yeah. years. Yeah, um, a great palate. Which I don't even really think is really that b much of a thing. Do you really think all, all the people who like are expert like like whiskey tasters are, have like such extraordinary palates where they can like discern like the vanilla from the burnt honey and oak? And, right. Or are they just bullshitting you? Yeah, it's hard for me to say because I don't have that sophisticated palate. But I just I do know that Sierra Nevada, their brews, even though they they come out with a lot of different IPAs, they tend to taste very similar. Um, well, it's not just them though; it's a lot. Right. I think I think that's just the trend of also too of like West Coast IPA style. It know, is, yeah. Because like, Stone Stone's the exact same thing. Sure. You know, yep. if you had one Stone beer, like again, they're all good. Mm -hmm. But you had one, you've probably had them all. There's a, there's just slight variations. I don't even know that I could explain the variations. Uh, but they're very slight, and I would say that their pale ale is is a really good beer. And there's a reason why it's their flagship. Most people don't make a pale ale their flagship beer. Saranac and one is this? Would, yep, Saranac would be the other. Would you say Saranac's pale ale is still their flagship? I think they've tried to make the uh, their because uh, I don't really see that in six packs. I, I, I know they tried to make their IPA now. Their, their I know, uh, the set, the Gen Four session. Yeah, because yeah. I know, like in the fifteen packs, their can you know can do variety. It's the Pale Ale, the Session Four, and I think uh, the Legacy IPA. Yeah. Um, but like like because around here in upstate New York, as we've talked about before, Saranac is our craft big craft brewer. Um, and it used to be everywhere you go. For Saranac, six and twelve packs, you could find pale ale anywhere. Mm -hmm. I can't find it anymore. Yeah, it's bigger. You can't, you can't find it as a standalone really anymore. Yeah, they, I think they branched out into the, the IPA territory more so than the pale ales now. I, I mean, I think Sierra, Sierra Nevada is also really for for going the pale ale more because I don't see I, and, I, and I don't see their you know pale ale as often. It's not not here. as uh, not as common, and the torpedo has become more common for sure. I mean, maybe out in California. Mm -hmm. But at least around, like, again, around here, yeah, it's just not... And, you know, the same thing with Sam Adams, too. It's like Boston Lagers, though it's still prominent, I find more of the, you know, the Rebel Rouser packs now than... Yeah. Like, they're, do the Boston Lagers. They're the Lager. ones, yeah. I think, so with Sierra Nevada, I think that there is a nice difference between the Pale Ale, the general Pale Ale, the, like, and the... Torpedo. This, and, well, and oh. the Torpedo, but yes, the BFD as well. Because the BFD is more crushable. They're right about that. I, so, I, I know you don't like that adjective, but they it is crushable in the sense that it is more like a session than you would get from the general paleo. Although, 
Just call it a session then. Right. <laughs> Although I would say that the tendency for those hops to fade during the drinking makes it so that it's not like your standard IPA either. I think it's a pretty good beer. It's very um, palatable. So I think that people who don't like IPAs will still enjoy the BFD. And I think they're right when they say beer for drinking. It's a very drinkable, um, not overly complex beer. And I, I like it quite a bit. I think like, you, you know, obviously if you're looking for something more complex, it's not the beer for you, but for a simple hot summer day, like we've been getting mm-hmm. good stuff. I, I gave it kind of a low, I gave it a three on untapped when I first had, it. I thought it was good, but I thought it was, yeah, it's definitely growing on me. It's become the go-to kind of tall boy for me because it's just like, it's light, refreshing, yet hoppy and malty at the same time, you know, definitely, you know. Because what it's like two nineteen for a tall boy, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's de- definitely worth the money to like I said, bu- you know, spend it a buck ninety nine like a Miller Lite tall boy. Right. Though it though it has its own merits, um, but no, I, I I definitely enjoy it. Um, I agree. I would love I would love to see it like in the fifteen packs. Oh uh, yeah, that would be nice. That yeah. I would I would that'd be something I would t- totally go to take advantage of. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, I'd say it's kind of like a sessions, a session version of Founders PC Pills. True. Because like the P, it kind of tastes like the PC Pills, but it's, it is lighter because the PC Pills is just like an, it's an upfront hoppy Pilsner. So even though it's a Pilsner, it's still kind of heavy for the style with all the hops that they put into it. This is kind of, you know, played a little bit back on the hops. So it's not as overwhelming, and it's just it's a lot more crushable. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would definitely love to see it in a fifteen pack. Same for me. Anything else you've had? Um, not really. No, nothing. Uh... Any liqueurs? Yeah, I did have the new. Uh, well, I shouldn't say new. It's new to me. Jack Daniel's rye, which is a very good uh, rye whiskey that you got me for my birthday. Yeah, happy birthday! So. Thank. Thank you. Belated. <laughs> um, and uh, so that was really good. And the Sazerac rye is also Which, really good. By the way, too, this, this is the first time I've ever seen Jack Daniels rye around here. It's not new. Because uh, before it used to just be Jack Daniels, Gentleman Jack, and Single Barrel yeah. around here. I've, I've known they made a rye for a while, but I, I, this is the hard, first time. Hard to find. Yeah. I think rye whiskey is becoming more and more popular. Because like, I would only go to like a liquor store now like once every six months mm-hmm. for someone's like birthday or whatever, like yours. Um, and I'm seeing more and more rye whiskeys, which is a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing. Because we, we're both big on rye whiskey. One of my favorites. So, yeah. So that was nice, uh, getting a bunch of rye whiskey for my birthday. So, yeah. But other than that, nothing nothing new. I almost got you Dr. McGillicuddy's coffee. I would like to. I would try it for sure. I don't know how much I would drink it like all the time, but that or the menthol mint. Oh, menthol mint. Interesting. I don't know. I don't know about that one. Do you love that? That, that they don't call it mint. Menthol. Yeah, I, I feel like I would think I would. I was like brushing my teeth all the time with that one. But you know what I brush with now? Cinnamon. It's nice. I like the crushed cinnamon. Yeah. Pro health. A little bit different. Yeah. Different from uh from like a peppermint flavor. So. Yeah, I just stick to the mints. All right, so uh, let's get into Ant Man and the Wasp now. Um, I'll will just go over uh, the recap real quick. So, Ant Man and the Wasp picks up about two years after the events of uh, Civil War, and uh, so Ant Man Paul Rudd, also known as um, Scott Lang, he's and and that's one thing about Ant Man and the Wasp too that. I think kind of carries over f- through a lot of Marvel movies. They never really refer to them as their superhero names. It's always their like actual names. Like when you think about Batman, it's always it's pretty much always Batman. I hate when they call him the Batman. Oh, the Bat. Yeah, that pisses mm. me off. Yeah, that that's that's a pet peeve of mine. I don't like that either. You're and right. I know, and I know that's how it originally started as you know the I, Batman. But I agree. I hate with like it's the guy, it's the Batman. I yeah, I have to go with you on that. It just doesn't roll off the tongue to say the Batman. We're not French, okay? <laughs> We're not putting a an article in front of everything. So, uh, so we so we pick up with Ant Man. He's uh nearly getting out of his uh home imprisonment 
He's been on... Um, Which, by the way, why would they only give him ho- uh, house arrest if, he, you know, for what happened in Germany? I feel like it's... Don't you think they'd want to lock him down? Like, in well, a, like, if you're going by the uh, the events of, in, of Civil War and that people are very concerned about superheroes overstepping boundaries then yeah you would think they would want to go a little bit more and make a uh make a um example of ant-man by saying like if you overstep your boundaries look at look at what we're going to do because they didn't catch captain they didn't catch black right you know you know no i i agree with that i don't know why house arrest was the specific uh Punishment of choice for Ant Man, but yeah, he does end up in house arrest for what is it like two years, two years. and uh, he's on the brink of getting out. He's got like three days left when the the film picks up, and uh, he actually gets roped into this scenario by um, Hope Van Dyne, who is the Wasp, and her father. Which they don't even call her the Wasp at all. No, no, never. That's yeah. That's what I mean. They never, they never really call. Do they him. do they in the first film refer to him as Ant Man at all, or um, or Hank Pym's thing? I don't really know. I can't remember too much. I mean, I do think that they do in some ways refer to him as Ant Man because it is an origin story in that sense, and they would need to at least a little bit. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's interesting that they don't refer to them and by their actual superhero names in here. But uh, it picks up as uh, Hope Van Dyne and Hank Pym are finding out that there probably is a way to save uh, Pym's wife, who would be Hope's mother, from the quantum... I, I, I don't want to say dimension, because it's not an op- alternate dimension, but it's a, the quantum realm that uh, she's been stuck in since... Um, I don't know, how long is it? Like 20 years? 30 years. 30 years. Uh, she's been stuck in there for a long period of time. Because she went, uh, as the the opening shows, the one day Hank Pym and her go off to uh, stop like a Soviet missile that's being launched towards America or whatever to, they could possibly start World War Three. They go to, but the only way to stop it is she's got to go quantum and she gets lost and yeah. Quantum physics. I mean, quantum realm. It's not. Even, it's not technically a realm, but she's just lost at the quantum scale. Right. And so, basically, the rest of Ant Man and the Wasp is about getting the ability to go quantum, get Hank Pym's wife Janet, and bring her back from the quantum realm to the real world. But the thing about this is that it's not as easy as just getting those parts to create this scientific experiment and do it because they've also got to contend with other people wanting the same technology uh, for one thing to sell it, which would be like the the mobster boss, um, uh, Sonny Birch, who's trying to get all this these parts and then sell it for even more money. And then you also have another what we'll call a villain, uh, in quotes, ghost, who is a, um, tragic. Yeah. Basically a tragic, not, not, I shouldn't say a hero, but an anti-hero who, uh, has suffered from quantum, um, exposure, I should say like quantum wave exposure. And, uh, now is never really able to be in the real world and reality because she keeps flickering because of her quantum, exposure well so that's the best way i know how to explain so, that. so in the first film because they allude to this all the time so you can fill me in in the first film paul rudd's able to go to the quantum realm and get out fine right yeah it's a uh like, I'm a assuming, quick quick i'm assuming journey. it's like the end of the film yeah where, basically like, he he's able to get there and he doesn't get lost and he's able to come back yep which you know Hank Pym, played by Michael Douglas, which, as I told you at the end of the film, I was sitting there for, like, three quarters of the film, like, God, I know who that is, but why can't I think of his name? And I'm, like, having an Alzheimer's moment, like, Michael, 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 and then three quarters of the way of the film, I almost jumped out of my seat and yelled, Douglas! I don't know why I couldn't, like, really think of who he was, because I... I, I know who Michael, du- I've seen plenty of Michael Douglas films, 
Honestly, I just think it's because in this film, he looks like a cross between Martin Sheen and Dennis Hopper. He, he does look very Dennis Hopper. He, yeah, yeah, I mean, well said, because that's because I mean I know the poor man's been dead for a while now, but uh, right, but, but I I was like when he's when when uh, Michael Douglas puts on uh, sunglasses, and that goatee. dark black sunglasses, a goatee, and the FBI uniform, he looks like Dennis Hopper in Speed. That or, uh, he could that, be that or Martin Sheen in The Departed. Yeah, like uh, he, either one. They could they could have take like photoshopped Dennis Hopper out of Speed and put Michael Douglas in Ant Man and the Wasp into Speed, and I would not know the difference. When we eventually do Jeff Daniels Month, can we do Speed? Just I to, would love to do just Speed to, just to talk about speed. how poor Jeff Daniels meets his end. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But uh, no, so. But okay, so in the first film, he jumps through. He's able to get yep. to the quantum yes. realm and able to come back. Um, so the the pro one of the problems I have is kind of the side story, and one of the side stories is the one villain, the like Cajun esque. Um. Wet, uh, technology dealer. Yeah, um, Sonny. Sonny. Played by Walton Goggins, who basically plays another version of his character in Justified. Um, he's entirely pointless. I agree. I, he's literally here for comedic relief for the whole, like, truth serum bit. Yep. Which is the goons, but still, is part of the, sh- the shtick. And to pad this film out. It's com- yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. What one of the things we constantly critique about films on this podcast is they're overly long. The two hour mark is now the benchmark for films. Every film, no matter what the hell they're doing, has gotta be two hours or longer. This film is Little over two hours. A little bit. Yep. So congratulations to them for not for having a little restraint. They, yeah, they didn't need to go two fifteen like yeah. most Marvel films. Um, this film could have been ninety minutes. I think it could have been you, lessened. Yeah. That that whole point of him being there to like try to steal the technology of the Pim, you know, of Hank Pym because he's interested in the money they can make from it. Entirely pointless. All you needed was Lawrence Fishburne. And the ghost. I agree. I that's all. That all you needed because we don't get any real like they give us backstory and exposition on them, but it, it's so minimal you don't really get to connect and feel like their struggle because they're not really focused on because they're jumping from them and then like oh well, it's to follow Sunny and the shit they're doing and, like you know <laughs> like I know this is meant to be more comedic, mm-hmm. but I you could like Lawrence Fishburne. Is a national treasure. <laughs> True. <laughs> kind of, kind of, kind of like Paul Rudd and Michael Douglas. And I, I, he can, he and, can, and I and I do like my and I do really like Lawrence Fishburne as, as an actor. I, I but, see, yeah. But they could have done more with him. True. Like, I think I like I think though he's good in this film. His part's so small overall, and so like bare bones, like. Just kind of there to get to what they're trying to do. They could have done more to make him a more interesting character and the ghost a more interesting character. Because, um, Han- uh, oh god, I can't see it right now. Hope? Is yeah. that who you're talking about? No, Ava, the ghost. Oh, okay, yes, yes, yeah, Ava, uh, Hannah John Kamen. Uh, this is a weird middle name, that's why I was kind of hanging up on that. Yes. Um, Hannah John Kamen. Like, her character, the ghost, Ava, it's a very interesting idea. Like, she, her father worked with Hank Pym and was ba- basically banished from S.H.I.E.L.D. and discredited as a scientist because of Hank Pym being an asshole. Pretty, yeah. And trying to restore his good honor, they continued to work on the quant. You know, trying to get to the quantum level, the work that Hank Pym was working on with S.H.I.E.L.D., with Lawrence Fishburne, and by just being that mad scientist her that her father was, trying to do that, the experiment goes awry, and she gets, you know, trying to save her dad out of love as a child, tries to help, and her parents get killed because of her father's experiment, and because of that experiment, 
her body's in a constant state of try of changing state um states and matter. Yep. That's why she's called the ghost because she's con- she phases because she's constantly shifting from gas, liquid, and solid. That's why she's able to you know phase around qu- you know quantum phasing as they call it in the film. It's a very cool and interesting idea. Makes her a really cool, tragic antihero. That's literally just there for three minutes, and we'll move off to like to Sunny and this and that and all. Oh, Paul Rudd's being kind of goofy, and you know, yeah. I think I think they could if they just focused on that as like you know, focused on that and compared to what Hank Pym and her daughter and Paul Rudd are trying to do. Well, not even Paul Rudd necessarily. He's just caught up in this because. He does, he's got two days left until he's free, and but now he's caught up in this. Now he's possibly gonna get fucked and you know not have his freedom. He Paul Rudd just cares about himself because he's a selfish bastard. Um, but if they, you had that dichotomy between like what's going on with Hank Pym and their daughter, try and his you know hope trying to save their wife and mother, and then Ava's story trying to become normal again because she's going to die because of this eventually Lawrence Fishburne being a former partner of Hank Pym's at S.H.I.E.L.D. helping her because of what he's done in the past it's an interesting storyline on its own and possible interesting character arc for both sides but again adding that third party in because superhero films have to always have like some kind of third party they can't just you know be simple Right, and, and it, not like a, it's more, it's almost like a MacGuffin villain that really yeah no it's a villain but it's not really like the big threat it's not the not the one that they're worried about I th- I do think you're right I, though I love Walton Goggins I like Walton Goggins here as Sonny Birch I I do like his character um, I do think it's unnecessary it is a waste of time I do wish that they had decided to focus a little bit more on Ghost because it does open up some interesting. Uh, Re- revelations about Hank Pym specifically and that the research that he's doing on quantum physics is has caused a lot of problems it's caused a, a lot of the issues that um, Ant-Man and the Wasp have to face in this film because it created Ghost uh, it um, has basically left his wife in the quantum realm for 30 years. Which I found interesting that they assume she's alive. How the hell is she living? And, you know, just because she shrunk to a subatomic particle. How, so what's she doing for food and, you know, like nutrients and... Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe somebody could explain that to me. But that, but I think it's, I think overall, though, like it's an interesting dichotomy between Ant-Man and Wasp, shrinking and growing abilities, and then Ghost... Being fa- you know, phasing, being able to, you know, they they are interesting elements. I just would like to have seen Ant Man go a little bit, Ant Man and the Wasp go a little bit more into Hank Pym as a character because there is a very interesting story about this sort of mad scientist character who has caused a lot of problems. Like he, yeah, he may have created some really interesting elements to the world. He may have been able to shrink and grow things at the quantum level and the atomic level, but at the same time, it's almost like that forbidden knowledge and that he's caused a lot of the issues that have cropped up in both of these Ant-Man films. And so he never really has his comeuppance here. He gets what he, he always gets the best uh, consequence of what he's done. So in this case, Yes, his his wife was lost for thirty years in the quantum realm, but she's miraculously okay. Um, yes, he did cause uh, a man to kind of go off and do his own research on quantum physics, and ultimately killed himself and his wife, and caused his his daughter to have a basically a lifetime of pain because she can't stay in one phase. But they're working together to you know rid the world of evil. I think Hank Pym, in a lot of ways, has caused a lot of these issues, and it would have been interesting to see the film go into that. However, that would have meant really jettisoning a lot of the comedy aspect of the film because, you know, it's tough to laugh at, like, one of your main characters when they kind of have been an asshole throughout the whole, you know, throughout their existence as they were doing the research. So, while I do understand... I think you can still be comedic. I mean, they're still, I mean... Hank Pym throughout this entire film is an asshole. True. 
Um, Paul Rudd is a lovable asshole. Because, I mean, again, he's self-centered and, like, he... He is. I think the whole the whole point of the film is him coming to the conclusion that he can't be self-centered here, but, yes, through, throughout well, most his, of Well, for his character arc, yes, but, I mean, you can still, like, have these self-centered asshole characters and it'd be funny. What is Seinfeld but just a bunch of self-centered true, assholes? True, true. And it's always sunny. Narcissistic. You know, taken, taken to the extreme of, you know, Seinfeld and being narcissistic. So you can have, like, them be all be narcissistic assholes, but it's, you know, still be humorous. I agree. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. They, they could have done that. I do think that you're, you're just, you're on the right track, though, that Sonny Birch and the character elements to that didn't need to be there. They do add a lot of humor to it. They are funny. I mean, they are funny. I do like the idea, which like I said, I don't know if he's supposed to be Cajun or what, like, cause he's like constantly slipping in and out of like different accents. Like one minute he's like talking like he's going to go like talk about crawl dads. Now I think it's the, more Southern. Yeah. It's basically like more Southern. S- southern it's, gentleman. That's Walton Goggins shtick. Uh, well, cause like sometimes it sounds like he's supposed to be like, you know, like I said, Cajun, like talking about crawl dad down by by you going, you know, we give him Dave Fontaine bone. And then be like, I got vapors. The, you the know, whole, like, um, the whole southern, uh, well read ma- man is really his shtick. Because that's what he he does the same thing in Justified as Boyd. That's, uh, very, you know, because in this film, he is a very, like, basically a walking dictionary in what he's saying. And that's, that, that's just the whole thing that he does. So I, I, I believe that they meant him to sound southern. Um, and, and it does, he does add a lot of, like, uh, ironic humor to this film, um, in that like, and, and unrealistic humor too, in that you're arguing with a bunch of goons about whether you have truth serum, and everybody's you know, at 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 a certain point in reality, if you're saying oh it's truth serum, and you're like no it's not truth serum, at that point if someone keeps arguing that it is truth serum, you're gonna just shoot them in the head. I think I think that's pretty much the pretty much the realistic expectation for that that encounter. But in this film. You know, you do have that comedy element to it, which I think works really well. And that's one thing I wanted to talk about it, about Ant-Man is that um, for a Marvel film, Ant-Man specifically, and along with Guardians of the Galaxy, really does adhere more to the comedy aspect of a superhero film than almost any other Marvel film. I mean, Marvel films do tend to have some comedy in them. They do tend to have lighthearted jokes and things like that. Um, but well, for the, I'd say all of them do. I mean, they, even Infinity War, as grim as a film that is, you know. But I think that Ant Man is just festooned with it. You know, um, <laughs> I've been waiting to break that word out. It, 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 it's 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 uh it's just overall classified for me more as a comedy than it and is an say, action film. And I would say too, it's you could almost say like Judd Apatow write this very much that like qu- you know quick you know like bang bang um you know like kind of like just weird observation type things that kind of go on and on yeah it's like quirky and quippy yeah um which i know is the, the thing these days to have you know the like as we saw in the trailer for like that R- wreck it ralph trailer yeah you know i mean that's how humor is bad and, I, and though i do enjoy that style and we've talked about because we've reviewed films like this before on the podcast um you have to have certain actors in there to do to do it well and some and though i enjoy this that type of humor if it's not with the right people it doesn't click at all but paul rudd's been doing this for 20 goddamn years now so you know that his kind of like ooh, wow ooh, boom, 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 you know yeah it all, you know. Definitely his his t- sort of clueless humor yeah. that he's not really cued into like the things that are happening. I think it works well, and I I will say that I think Ant Man and the Wasp is probably one of the funniest Marvel films. I feel like we say that for every new like every it, new one. It's like when Thor Ragnarok came out, I was like yeah, one of the funniest ones. And then, it's like, true, and then when Spider Man, one of the funniest ones. I, I, it is true, but I I would actually say that. Ant Man and the Wasp has, for one, surpassed the original Ant Man in, in, in terms of humor. I can't say, but um, and then I would also say that from the recent ones that we've seen, it is most definitely more better than Doctor Strange, for sure. Um, I would say that it is um a little bit above Thor Ragnarok for me, and it's hovering right around Spider Man Homecoming in terms of you know 
the best use of humor. I would in say a I would film. say even better than Spider-Man. You think Hulk. so? And I, I and though I do think Thor Ragnarok is great on humor because Chris Hemsworth is the for the most part the you know he's not always yeah like the and, whole and, and, the whole part with like Hulk you know he's intentionally hilarious but for the most part he's kind of playing it straight and everyone else like Jeff Goldblum as the Grandmaster and all these others are you know kind of being the humorous parts. I think here it definitely works the best because even asshole again asshole Hank Pym is hilarious and kind of intentionally hilarious. You know, like are you gonna you know stop ogling my daughter and get to you know what you're supposed to be doing right now. You know, um, and and two the Ant Man and the Wasp also benefits from having those set pieces that are inherently comedic when you know they're arguing about how large they've gotten. You know, when, when Lawrence Fishburne and Paul Rudd are arguing about how big and how tall they've they've been able to grow uh, using their powers, there's in, there's that inherent comedy uh, for the subject matter. Because when you think about Ant-Man, it's like the premise is so ridiculous that you have to laugh at it in some ways. You can't you can't watch it and just completely take it seriously. Whereas some other superhero films, you might be able to just t- take it at face value it, it, and not really have that humor. But a man who basically can shrink or grow and uses ants to fly around with, there's an inherent comedy in that. No, are those robots? The ants themselves? Yeah. I believe that they're meant to be taken as actual ants. Yes. Uh-huh. Because I, I, like I said, yeah, it's, yeah, well, no. it's one of the things I've been. I was wondering when I was watching. Like, because they use the hive mind sense of an ant to do the bidding of Hank Pym as he programs uh, trains them to to do. So I, I believe that yeah, they're they're meant to be real ants. All right, so let's talk about our favorite Paul Rudd moments. I'm a huge Paul Rudd fan. We all are. I mean, he's just lovable. He's a he's a lovable man. In in uh, Ant Man and the Wasp, they they are sure to get in a quick shot of Paul Rudd shirtless where you can see that the man has gotten fucking ripped lately. It's disturbing. I, I don't like my Paul Rudd. I'll be honest. honest I'll Rub. be honest. <laughs> Paul Rudd with abs. I'll be honest with you. I don't either because I always felt like he was the everyman, kind of like the, the guy who didn't really care that much about his physique. And I was like, Oh, you know what? He's like me. He's like yeah. me. You know, I like, I, yeah. I work out sometimes, but yeah. You know, he's I'm not a- overly concerned with my appearance. And now he's ripped and now I gotta do that too. Yeah, yeah. Now my now my wife's no. craving that. I know. Well no, it's like it's like as I was telling you, it's like him and knocked up. He's this guy, he's like, I got Hideki Matsui in my fantasy draft, guys. Yeah. I got Hideki Matsui. I can relate to that. Six packs at six pack app, I can. Now yeah, now he's now he's craveable. I don't know. That's what my wife says. Well, she's got a strange <laughs> no, taste. No, no, but I'm just saying, in this film, he definitely, they did sneak that in there. They were like, hey, check which, this which out. Which is funny, because he doesn't, as his, he doesn't need to be, like, fit for not. His- yeah, true. I mean, for, for the most part, like, even even his um superpower, being Ant-Man, it's as they've shown. Super, well, it's, it's not even a superpower. It's uh, technology. It, right, it's more like technology and and he has the benefit of being able to sink down to the quantum level, so you have and like gr- and grow, and grow. So, so you, yeah, you have those powers that really, you know, like if you wanted to, you could just grow really high, squash the person, and then you're done, and you shrink down. As we see in this film, you know, you can't grow too high because you you get so your bi- biological impulses get so tired that you actually will just fall asleep and and uh, probably you know wherever you are, but. But it, you can grow to a ginormous size, at least for a little bit. And um, so he is a really powerful sense. superhero. Yeah, in that sense. <laughs> um, so, but what are your favorite parts from Paul Rudd in this film? Because he does have, he, you know, I would actually, before we get into that too, I would say that um, he, he has, though he is the main character as Ant-Man, his actual impact on the film is somewhat minimal. Because a lot, a lot of it is focused on Hope, and Hank, Hope Pym. and Hank Pym and Ghost, rather than Ant Man. He's kind of along for the ride. It's kind of a, it's an interesting idea, and it it almost is like giving the Wasp her own sort of origin story, while also involving it as a sequel into the Ant Man universe. So I, I mean, I think that's interesting. I think it works here. But 
for the most part. And which will be funny, because how, how is that going to play out in Infinity War? True. I guess we'll see. But, um... Like I said, we'll get we'll get to that at the ending in a bit. But um, he's got a lot of good moments. I really like one that stands out to me is when they go to the school to get the trophy from his daughter, um, which apparently is hiding the original Ant Man suit in it. Um, I just love the part when he comes because he has to shrink down to the size of a kid and pretend to be a kid, and when he, they go running, scurrying on back to the Hank Pym van, um. Just when they get in there, and he's like crawling in there because he's too small to get in there. And Hank Pym's like, "Oh, you tired, buddy? You want a cookie? You, want, you know, you need a juice box? You know, that, that that was fun." Yeah, and then he responds with, "Do you actually have those?" Yeah, yeah. That that is a definite Paul Rudd. Moment, yeah, Paul right? Rudd like esque line, but yeah. you know that that was funny. And it's just funny, like thinking of Mike, you know, Michael Douglas, fame to claim that. <laughs> you want a Capri Sun? <laughs> you know you. One of those Kool-Aid, you know, bursters, you know. Another one of my favorites is um, when Paul Rudd actually uh, grows and he uses a uh, flatbed truck as a sort of like cart scooter. To, yeah, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, cart or scooter to scoot down the down the uh, the uh, highway. That's pretty funny. I liked when he grow, grew to like, you know, Godzilla-esque proportions and he's on, you know, the boat. You're like, kind of like, ha, <laughs> I'm big, and he kind of just, you know, flicks, fl- yeah. flicks all sunny and grabs the, you know, that that was funny. Um, I think he has a lot of good moments that he really does use uh, his natural likability and charm to his advantage in here. And it's really, you know, you, one could say that Paul Rudd basically is Paul Rudd all the time. I mean, he doesn't, he's almost like Jeff Goldblum in that they have like one ability and it's B- Paul Rudd or be Jeff Goldblum and you run with it. And the thing about that though, is that when it works, it works. So it works for Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum doesn't need to be anything besides Jeff Goldblum. He can be Jeff Goldblum in every film and no one is really going to, you know, well, he's, complain about well, that. He's at that age now. Cause like Denzel Washington, I saw like the cl- uh, trailer for the new Denzel Washington. Film. Yeah. He's just playing Denzel. Denzel Washington. Washington. And, uh, uh, but I think Paul Rudd is playing Paul Rudd, but at the same time, he's not. As because as we had in our little news broadcast opening, he's becoming very own Wilson like. True, true. Very yeah. ooh ooh wow wow ooh wow wow mm, you know a lot of hums and haws he's adding to you know his. Uh... I'm okay with that. I'm okay no, with I'm, that I, specifically I, in Ant Man because he does have that sort of. He's not a quantum physicist. He's not a scientist. He a doesn't very, understand. Very, yeah, very much a layman. No, I get that, but it's like compared like compared to like. If you like, like his earlier films, if you like, think of like the Ju- all those Judd Apatow films, like he's got that, you know, one of my favorite lines from Paul Rudd ever is from the 40 year old virgin. Uh, you've seen that. Yeah. When they, they go, he just goes in and he's like, and he's, you know, he's like, I just got to tell you, if I got to listen to this goddamn Michael McDonald DVD <laughs> one more time. I'm going to come in here and fucking shoot everybody in here <laughs> and then blow my goddamn brain, you know. Yeah, and, you no. Know, I, just he like, actually did used to play like when he was in his earlier comedic roles, more of a dick character. More yeah. Of a, uh, prickly. Yeah. 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 For sure. And then he's kind of over time, become more Owen Wilson. Cause Owen Wilson doesn't act anymore for the most part. Right. He's, you know, kind of went, I don't know if his situation was like Rick Moranis, but he's kind of just Rick Moranis. He just, you know, yeah. kind of, I think that, you know, Paul Rudd has done that where he's kind of been able to, transition from the dick rolls to being like the more uh regular guy that is a lead rather than what he used to play which is yeah basically he used to play like a sort of a a secondary part douche character and and now he's more of the the lead buffoon sort of thing or or getting what you would call getting dunked on all the time uh that's pretty much his and, and that's cool with me too because i can relate to that so Oh, you're getting dunked on? No, no, I'm just saying, but I'm just saying, like, I wouldn't consider myself an alpha male, you know? I'm not, uh, gonna be a, uh, one of the, one of the uh, main characters in an action, action hero movie or something like that. So I can kind of, uh, relate to Paul Rudd in that sense. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about, if 
we're done sharing our Paul Rudd moments. I mean, he he is a highlight of this film. I, I yeah, and that that's the interesting thing about this film is that, like I said before, Paul Rudd it really though he is a highlight, and though it's called Ant Man and the Wasp, it's not really his movie. He's kind of I would say it's almost like a Mad Max trope where he's sure along for the ride. Yes, where he's just, yeah, and you know, like it centers around him, but really. It's more the secondary characters, Hank Pym and and Hope, or the Wasp, that are the real draws for this film. And they are kind of getting their own origin story here, as evidenced from the beginning of the film, which is a cold open with Hank Pym and Hope, noting that they're going to find... Try to find... Try to find Janet. And so that that's an interesting perspective, too, that this is really a Wasp story more so than it is an Ant-Man story. Ant-Man is really just there to get back in the Wasp's good graces, which I would, too, Evangeline Lily. I, I would. Yeah. I know you say, yeah, but I, I, I say I, I would as well. I mean, she's I'd, no scared. I'd go for that. No Black Widow. Um, <laughs> The other thing that I wanted to bring up is the CGI in this film, because it's pretty seamless. Um, I would say um, the type of powers that are in this film, growing and shrinking, very much lend itself to CGI. Yep. Yeah, I mean, a lot, you really a lot, not, I say a lot, I mean, you can't really do the practical. So this is like the film that this is made for. Kind of like how Doctor Strange is made for having to use CGI. And it looks, I think, it, you're right, it is seamless. It's very well done. Um, I think in some ways... So, so in some instances, like, with like when they grow things, like the kind of plastic and metal doesn't, you can tell, like, it looks like it's being, like, rendered on a PS4. You yeah. know, like like the whole like where they're dancing on like you know shrink down and running on like the knife that is like okay that kind of looks sure. a wonky and when the Pez dispenser gets blown up that looks kind of a little lamp but for the most part it looks it looks really good. I think the bit the bigger things is that uh, Ant Man and the Wasp doesn't rely on the dark stormy fiery uh, backgrounds that most superhero films and especially the DC films really rely on like you know every. Every scene at the finale of one of these films is taking bro- place in like this broad dark- daylight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and at least in this, yeah, I know you're right because like in other films, it's gotta be grim. It's yeah, it's Here- dark and fiery, and there's explosions. It's apocalyptic. In this film, yeah, you don't really have that, and they don't try to hide the CGI behind a dark scene or something like that. The CGI stands on its own because it really just works. So when things shrink or disappear, um, or or grow tall. It's really just happening seamlessly within the frame. And I, I was really impressed with that in, in that they were able to do this so seamlessly. And um, they be- Well, by this point, they be- their special effects team better have this shit down. True. I think what also <laughs> lends itself with the Ant-Man films is that the uh, action seems feel a little bit different than they would in a normal uh, superhero film because there's no, like, regular fighting. There's no regular, like... Uh, I'm going to just punch this guy, punch this guy, punch this guy. It's more like I'm going to punch this guy, shrink down, punch him again, kick him with my, you know, my tiny wing, then shrink, then grow back up, punch him again. Though it's adding the new Marvel trope. Gotta have a car chase all the fucking time now. True, but I think the car chase works pretty well. I mean, it's still fun. It's all, you know, it'd be kind of cool if they cut, because they're in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. It'd be cool if they had like a little tribute to Bullet. Yeah. You know, it's the Steve McQueen movie. I think they have, I mean, in general, though, they do reference San Francisco pretty well. I mean, they show the, the, um, they might wind, as well, windy, uh, hill. Yeah, no, they might, like they, they might as well have opened the film up with, diggity, 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 everywhere you yeah. look, everywhere I, there's a hum. And Paul Rudd, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, well, I mean, I know, I mean, it's, it's a fun car chase, but it's, it's, I'm, like I said, it's like kind of like a che- it's a new checkbox now. True. You're gonna have Infinity War 2, like Captain America chasing down Thanos in like a car, like, oh, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get you, and he's like, no. Yeah, because we can check it off. I mean, Black Panther had a car, yeah. car chase. Um, and it's basically any modern sort of superhero film that it makes sense to have a car in, they will have a car chase. Or a boat chase. Or a spaceship chase. You know, it's it's uh, definitely a thing now. Um, but I, I think they do it pretty well, and I, I don't have any complaints about that. I didn't have any complaints about any of the CGI, which is really not that common for me, because I, in general, I don't like the CGI, but I felt like it was so well done in Ant-Man and the Wasp, but it was, it was just very seamless. And you didn't notice um, 
any really bad effects. And well, like I said, I think too, like the whole premise of the film definitely lends itself. Like you, you could, if you're creative enough, you could do a Batman film and not have CGI. Absolutely. You know, you could easily, I think Batman is one of the easiest and superheroes and I'll say, to do. And a great example of that is Dark Knight. Cause a lot of the effects in the Dark Knight are practical. Right. You know, I mean, how often is Batman traipsed around in, like, an alternate dimension? Not very often. Well, in the comic most, books, yeah. You know, I mean, what? yeah, but most of the time it's set in a, a basically a realistic setting, Gotham, basically New York City, uh, with a realistic villain who is human. Most of the time. Not like Clayface or something like that, but... You could, you could still get away with doing, like, a probably... Like a, yeah. Pretty cool... Or same thing with Killer Croc, you could do, like, a really, you know... Yeah, I mean, well, so basically what we're getting at is that there are some some superhero films that really overuse the CGI, and then at that point it becomes exhausting because you're like, why? W- why was that necessary? Whereas in Ant-Man and the Wasp, it's definitely necessary, and um, it's done so well that you really don't even think about it. It just kind of comes off as realism, and you, you go with that, and that's fine. Even the quantum realm, which in this film... Um, is a pretty significant portion, more so than the original Ant-Man. Uh, the CGI works fine in s- terms of giving us... It's not really like a, what you would think of as like a world. It's more like a uh, psychedelic um, dimension full of weird fluctuating color. And that's all that the quantum realm is. And, and even so, it doesn't come off as being like a green screen effect. You, it, it looks more than that. It's not like the characters are just standing in front of a green screen. Well, that I think that would be, you know, probably look terrible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's something that we've seen before. We've seen it in the DC movies where it's pretty apparent that they're just basically standing in front of a green screen of fire in the background. I mean, it's not like – you're right to that point that, you know, it should look like that, that they're not standing in front of a green screen. But we've seen it. And well, the money at this point they're spending on to make these films, you know – no, pen, no it, pennies being exactly. Despair. That's that's why we're not as lenient when it does look like shit, because there's no reason mm-hmm. for it because of the money that was spent on it. And I wouldn't say that probably Ant Man is their biggest blockbuster. And they're not going to blow a ton of cash on it, but not, still, this, I mean, it's a. I think these like uh, what's the next one? Captain Marvel's the next one, right? I believe so. I think that would be the next one. So it's literally like they're right now. It's kind of like doing placeholders until we sure. get to the yeah, you know. The big things that are going to happen. They'll, they'll do a new Spider-Man and yep. whatnot before Infinity War 2, so that's going to be... I think now is the time to talk about that ending from Ant-Man and the Wasp, because... They get Michelle Pfeiffer out of, you know, the quantum realm. To be honest with you, I did not recognize that as Michelle Pfeiffer. Did no, you? No. I didn't either. I did to- totally... I was like, who? who is this woman? <laughs> Still looks pretty hot, you know, for an older woman. Playing Michael Douglas' character, uh, character's wife, but I'm still curious to how she survived. Well, she said she's been able to adapt and evolve, which gives her the power to help Ghost at the end. Which that's your MacGuffin. But at the same time, it's kind of like, so what have you been doing for thirty? Years? I'm I actually that would be a really interesting movie how, to have. How like, are you not insane? Like go, have gone insane from just, it? Would, like, it would be like really interesting to have a movie called The Pims. And it would be in the Marvel <laughs> Universe, and it would be set after the events of Ant-Man and the Wasp when, when Janet comes back. And it's basically, all it is, is Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer. And Michelle Pfeiffer keeps talking about how much she's ch- been changed from this these 30 years in the quantum realm. And you just see, like, how different she is and, like, the different reactions. Because you can imagine, like, being in a quantum realm, first of all... Most people in even solitary confinement are different after they come out of solitary confinement. So being in a quantum realm, not only with no people, but no recognizable uh, objects that you know of. To communicate. How different yeah. are you? And and then like them talking about their sex life and how she doesn't like need it anymore. Because she's been in a quantum realm that's like completely changed her outlook on humanity. That would be an interesting movie to me. Like, oh, I don't want that right now. I can see that being... Well, Michael Douglas is at the age now where he's probably... Um, yeah. I'd rather, be a, I'd rather read the newspaper. That right would now. be a heavy R-rated <laughs> Marvel film that really delves into uh, the themes of humanity, <laughs> uh, s- social and moral ethics. Might as well just put that on Netflix then. 
That's right. I'm going to write it. It's going to be <laughs> very depressing. <laughs> it's going to be very depressing. But I mean, so yeah, um, she gets out of the quantum realm because of Hank. Um, the ghost is, she's, Ava stopped um, for the power of love. Basically. Um, that somebody believes in her. Yeah. Um, Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer is able to f- magically heal her because uh, she uses her, what she's learned in the quantum realm of being able to channel, quant- I guess, quantum fi- yeah, something. energy. Something, I don't know. Lawrence Fishburne, who is never even really a bad guy, he was just helping Ava because he was able to sympathize with her and, you know, trying to correct the mistake that Hank made. Cause, you know, that's why I said it's kind of squandered, because, like, it's, you know, his... He's, like, the equivalent of an economic terrorist. Like, or not an economic, I'm sorry, ecological terrorist. And that he has the... The intentions are all good, but he gets roped into, like, something ridiculous. But I wouldn't even say terrorist, though, because he's trying to help her, but when she doing th- starts doing things like, I want to, like, try to kill Paul Roy's yeah, daughter. he, he to, does back off in He's that like, sense. no, no, we, you have to do it the right, you know. Yeah. You know, we're like, you know, so I wouldn't say terrorist. I would just say, like, he, he's, he's well-intentioned, but, but a little bit na- he, naive. Yeah, naive. I now, think he's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think he's me. naive and he just doesn't really know what to do in this situation because who knows what to do with someone who's phasing in and out of existence all the time and is in constant pain. I mean, it's really... And he, oh, he's been, you know, dealing with her for 20 years, you know, since that accident because he, again, worked for S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, yeah, know, I mean, so. I would say in, in that sense, he's like a sympathetic character that is almost like a s- symbol for someone who deals on a daily basis with another person who has a disability. He's a character. Yeah, exactly. And and it's in that sense like someone who's de- been ha- literally had to devote their life to another person and caring for them and in return he doesn't really know what to do with that person. And he's maintaining the status quo trying to help them but he doesn't know how. And it you know that I think that works as a as a character trait for him. You're right. I think it probably could have used a little bit more in-depth um a little more exploration. Yeah, yeah, but and and it's always good to see Lawrence Fishburne on screen too. So he's not really doing too many roles, I think, these days. So, um, yeah, I mean, so because when, when I saw him, I'm like, I think I haven't um, seen you in a while. There was, no, I mean, he, I think he does Blackish, the TV show on uh, ABC, the sitcom. But uh, other than that, I don't really think he does too awful much. So yeah, I mean, it was nice to see him, but um. I mean, I mean, I mean, but anyway, yeah, so she gets saved and then she's willing to, from being saved, she's willing to accept the consequences of her actions because she's, you know, now she's got a new lease on life. Lawrence Fishburne won't let her go because he's been with her for 20 years and he's willing to accept the consequences with her. Uh, Paul Rudd gets his happy ending He's because at the same time all this is going on, the FBI is like, there's some tomfoolery <laughs> going on here. And, you know, able to, he's able to escape being caught by the FBI and he gets his freedom and able to see his daughter. Which, by the way, that blonde haired woman, is that like his ex wife? Yeah. I really don't like the whole, oh, I'm still buddy buddy with my ex wife and who's, you know, who she's fucking now type <laughs> thing, you know. Kind of like the, the whole uh, Mark Wahlberg, well, Will Ferrell thing. You know what, the. Which I don't know from the first film. Yeah, the original. The, the first Ant Man does kind of deal with that a little bit more because they're not so close, but then over time. Through the, yeah. Right, yes. Through his uh, understanding of his abilities as Ant Man and stuff, they become closer. So I think that's. Uh, it's almost like sort of if you think about the Santa Claus. It's the same concept. Yeah, but of, e- even still, at the end of the Santa Claus, Tim Allen doesn't like Neil. Yeah, no, that's true. I think <laughs> even though in Ant Man 2, though. If I recall correctly, I don't think Paul Rudd really likes yeah, his but, ex's, you know, new but, bow. But I mean, but even still in this one, he, there is, they all seem like, you know... I think it's more so that the the new guy likes Paul Rudd a lot, and but it's not reciprocal. You know, is, you know who should have... Which, that new guy doesn't have that big of a part, but you know who should have played him? Would have been perfect for the role? Patrick Warburton. True. Can yeah, you just I mean, imagine was, him like... What's going on here? Yeah, you know? no, I could, I could see that. Yeah, I, uh, 
Judy Greer, yeah. She she I mean, I think they really just try to get her in here as much as possible. Shoe horner. Yeah, basically. So just so they can, she'd be like, You're not allowed to do this and so she her, her bow could be like, actually they can't do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like they—they they don't have a bit. I mean, a big part, but for the most, because like I said, I haven't seen the first Ant Man. So I'm like, who the, you know, I'm assuming this is, you know, the mother of his child, and you yeah. know, they're on friendly terms because they're like, because she's defending him, and it's like, oh, that's so awkward. You I, weren't, you weren't a big fan. It's, it's not that. It's just because my natural instincts would be. I would like. I would never want. <laughs> yeah, you would you would not be forgiving. You'd just be like, no, 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 out I, of my life. No, I have a laminated list of, <laughs> you know, of you know of enemies, yeah. hold grudges forever. No, I I wouldn't have the. I, I don't think most people would. It's true, but um, yeah, that was kind of weird. But anywho, so the ending is happy ending, and then you know, Hank and M- Michelle Pfeiffer they're gonna ride off into the sunset, and they're gonna explore more of the quantum realm. And as they're going to launch Paul Rudd into the quantum realm and try to get him to get some quantum energy and come back, he's not retrieved. And that's because Infinity War is taking place now, and Thanos has won. And Hank Pym, Hope, and Janet. Part of the 50% that Thanos just... Wiped out of existence, and Paul's now stuck in the quantum realm, wondering what the hell's going on. I do like that they ended with this. And I told you that's how it's going to end. Well, it no, was... I know I know that it was going to end where Infinity War picks up. I mean, I, I think that's well, where, where, Infinity end, War where Infinity War ends. I think that was pretty much... A dead giveaway. Yeah, what <laughs> everybody expected. But I do like that they left Ant-Man in peril. Well, that's what makes sense. You'd have to figure, like, you know... You want it to be sort of a... I mean, not just that 50% of the population has been destroyed, but also that now you have people who were left on Earth who are in a predicament. And I think that just makes sense for, like you said, the serial nature of this film, of the of the Marvel series, is to carry that on. You You now have to wait. To find however, out, like, however it, long it's going to be to find out what happens to, to like how Ant-Man. does you know how does Ant Man get out of this situation and, 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 and what and how is he going to play a part in taking down Thanos? Because now you know, yeah, he's the, the whole reason he's here. There's got to be a reason he's here, so he's going to play some kind of part with like probably the quantum physics part and being able to destroy Thanos, especially since he's been like, able to or uh, to reverse it, you know, yeah, especially since he's been able to pretty much. Uh, understand the quantum realm now in a way that they weren't able to before the events of Ant-Man and the Wasp. I think it's an interesting element too, because from what we've seen, Ant-Man not being involved in Infinity War whatsoever, he's clearly not really considered an important <laughs> superhero for the Avengers. Like no one really is even, re- Well, even uh, let's say superheroes are very true. He's not, a it's, it's a loose term for him. Cause yeah, I mean, it's basically just a suit that he uses. He's very, po- he technically is very powerful being able to shrink down to the quantum level or grow to a significant size. But yeah, he's not what you would consider a superhero in the sense of what the others have. Now was Hank Pym working for shield in the first film or was he already out of shield? I believe he was already out of shield. I think, I th- think, I don't think he was in shield at that time. I think he was kind of too transgressive for shield and so they were so like th- after yeah. working for shield for 30 years samuel's like all right that's it yeah pretty pretty much you're out <laughs> so i can't i can't really remember but that's that's what i want to say um but i did like the ending i like that it ends with that because i do i do like how bleak infinity war ended and i do think that it makes sense to really tie those things in with ant-man and the wasp um and so I, I again, I think it just encourages people to look ahead, to look forward to the next element in the Marvel universe, and hopefully, I'm not, I don't, I don't mean hopefully because it's not like it needs to, but it will be interesting to see how this really does impact the Marvel universe going forward because 
it would be really disappointing if it didn't considerably impact it in some way. Well, like I said, it's going to have to. Yeah. It's kind of like you, how... You can't do, just... Like, as we said before, how Doctor Strange kind of comes off as meaningless, but then when you get to Infinity War and he's got that one line of, I've seen a, like a million futures and there's only one way we're going to win this. Yeah. So it's like, even I, though Ben and Cumberbatch is kind of like, you know, for the most part a side character, that one line alone makes him like a very integral part because... Even though he gets wiped out, there's got to be some way that he already has kind of figured out how they're going to win. You know or what you, they're going to have to do to you, win. You have to have some sort of stakes here going coming out of Infinity War. You have to have something that doesn't mitigate Thanos killing fifty percent of the population and then being reset. That everything is reset back to normal. Everything's fine. You know, no, nothing changes. The status quo goes back to normal. You can't have that you, after such a big event like this. Um, you need to have something that resonates. And I could potentially see them ending Ant-Man from here and saying, like, Ant-Man makes the ultimate sacrifice. That's it. Because I, Ant-Man being what I would consider a more insignificant character, it would make sense maybe to not have him return. But you got our, as we talked about with Infinity War, uh there's already one person that's really on the chopping block for that, though. True. And that's Robert Downey Jr. Yep. Just the way the whole, how Infinity Wars played out and how his ten, again, he's the one that started, mm-hmm. well, I guess technically the first Hulk did, but, you know, he's kind of been the standard bearer for the film franchise yeah. for ten years now, so, and he's getting up there in age. He's not going to want to do more Iron Man films. Or play Tony Stark, you know, anymore, really. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and like I said, like if there's anyone who's slated to definitely probably be on the chopping block at the end of Infinity War, it's going to be, all right, moving forward, out of canon. Well, they're not out of canon, but, you know, out from the storyline, it's definitely gonna, probably going to be him. And it doesn't seem like they have any intention of telling a single Iron Man story in the future either, so... Well, it's been years now. Right. It's been a long time yeah. since Iron Man 3. But, but I'm, just, I'm just saying, like, with uh, Ant-Man in peril in this film, at the end of it, it does... It would make sense to me uh, that they would be able to write Ant-Man out as a permanent, you know, fatality in the Infinity War saga. Um, I could see that happening. I don't know that that will happen. And I think it also depends on how long Paul Rudd plans to stay on as Ant-Man. As Ant-Man. Because I could see him already say, sort of getting out of it. You know what I mean? It's already been, what, uh, four, years. four years since the other Ant-Man and, and he really did, had a bit part in Civil War. So I could see him kind of getting a little... And he's 49 already. No, no so, pun, inten- yeah. pun intended, but antsy about playing Ant-Man and, and kind of preparing to exit. So I could see that happening as well. I mean, if you think if you think about it, just like kind of like on age based, I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch is old too. So you is could, Mark Ruffalo. That too, yeah. but I mean, the difference between Mark Ruffalo though is the Hulk. You can just CGI. True. Which you know you don't really need to I, constantly I have mean, Mark Ruffalo on screen. Yeah. So and I think, but at the same time with Doctor Strange too, you could have like a sagely you know wizard figure kind of leading the charge. I will not leading the charge, but like being there and, but like you, you could possibly see Benedict Cumberbatch being like, all right, you know, kind of sacrificing himself because he's our, you know, an yeah. older character. Like, I, well, like characters we know that are going to be like staples going up f- further, like Black Panther, mm-hmm. um, Spider-Man. He's only like 17 years old. So, yeah. you know, they're going to have a lot of mileage out, you know, they could do films from now on about like him just growing up with like Mary Jane, you know, boom, true, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, um, there's been rumors about Crim- Chris Hemsworth moving on. He, I think they, Disney would just need to throw more money at him, but they probably would, oh, it'd probably be like Daniel Craig with less bond films. Right. Like, he's like, I'm not doing Spectre. And they like, you know, yeah. uh, you know, you'd already, you know, and Sony threw him like a shit ton of money. He's like, okay, I'll do, you know, yeah. I mean, Chris Hemsworth isn't old, but I mean, like... Yeah, and Chris Evans, too. I mean... Well, again, same thing, but he's not old, too. Like, he could play Captain for, like, another 15 years, if you mm-hmm. want. And same thing with Chris Hemsworth. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Black Panther... Yeah, Black Panther's definitely not going I mean, to. Scarlet Witch, I, I can't see Elizabeth Olsen moving on. 
Well, she's a bit player, though. She's, right, but I'm just saying, I, you know, if they wanted to. Scar Jo, probably not. I mean, I think I could see her staying on. It's easy money at this right. point. Right, yeah. So. Um, trying to think who else. I mean, other than that, I. Cr- I would be interested to see them, like, introduce, like, you know, newer characters. I would love to see them, like, Disney wrangle the rights away from. X Men? For, yeah, from Fox for X Men. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Even like to bring in like a ridiculous character like Silver Surfer or something like that. Well, then you have to wrangle. I think it's Fox. Is it Fox that owns the rights too for Fantastic Four? Possibly. I can't remember because yeah. that's separate too. Like, because be, like when you think about it now, like in the whole like entire Marvel universe, it's kind of like would it be cool to think about Infinity War? Like, so what are the X Men up to? Mm-hmm. What you know? What are the Fantastic Four doing? You know. But they're not part of this universe because, you know, they're in different movie, you know, film studios own their rights. Yeah. Which is a damn shame because there hasn't been a good X-Men film in God knows how long. And Logan. I mean, I didn't see it, but yeah, I have not, I've, I've heard I, that I, it is good. I haven't been interested in standalone Wolverine films. And at this point, you get, like, you know, Hugh Jackman's got to want to move on, too. Well, he... <laughs> he, he did. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's Logan. Oh, he didn't yeah. do... Uh, no... Oh, I don't well, want to I, ruin I, the movie for you, but well, no, go ahead because I'm not going to see. Yeah, like no, I said, he dies. I don't, I don't. Wolverine dies, and you can't kill Wolverine though. But he regenerates. L- yeah, so Hugh Jackman's out for now. Yeah, until a sack of money lays <laughs> out his door, he's like, "Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy." Um, um, but yeah, I mean, I re- I think it would be interesting to see the X Men come into play too. But I don't, I don't know. If the, I don't know that we'll see that at least in the near future. I don't know, I'm just trying to think of like other yeah. Marvel, you know, because like you know, I mean, get, I mean like, you have get, a lot like, of the Marvel ones that are Netflix based. That, like uh, they're not you wouldn't see on film though, right? I mean, but it doesn't make much sense to because the ones that they chose for Netflix, while you know, really interesting for Netflix as a series, would be some big picks for movies too, like The Flash. I mean, Flash is a huge character. Not, not not the Flash. I mean, um, Daredevil. Uh, Daredevil. The Daredevil is a huge character, and it just—I don't know why they would ostracize Daredevil from the movies. Isn't it funny now thinking back to like when they were making early like Marvel films? Like one of the first ones to kind of get picked from the lot. Yeah. Daredevil and Elektra and Blade and yeah. yeah, Blade would be fun. Blade would definitely be fun to bring into the universe. It'd be cool to see how, like, man, I, I just have a hard time seeing anyone play Blade outside of Wesley Snipes now. <laughs> well, they just need to get him back. All right, so uh, we should probably give this a rating So we're running long. What would you give Ant-Man and the Wasp out of... Mmm. Mmm. Two a roll over there? What's that? Yeah, no, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of a, uh, a scale here. Oh. All right, out of ten Michael Douglas sunglasses, what would you give <laughs> Ant Man and the Wasp? I'll give it a seven and a half. It's a, it's a pre- I'm surprised with how funny of a film it was. Um, just about most of the jokes for me worked. It was uh, pretty funny. Um, most of the major characters in this film, uh, Paul Rudd, obviously Michael Douglas. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed and liked Lawrence Fishburne. Um, you know, I I, th- I thought for the most part the casting overall, everyone was really good. I just thought uh, it was kind of a waste of Lawrence Fishburne and uh, Hannah John uh, came in as Ghost. Um, I thought they could have definitely done more. And though uh, Walton Goggins was hilarious in that, you know, nice cajun trafficker of arms... Um, totally unnecessary. I think they definitely could have trimmed some of the fat in this film, make it a 90 minute film. Uh, effects looked good. It was just was a just overall enjoyable watch. Though I will say there was one time in this film I did look at my phone thinking the film was almost over with and we were only an hour in. When like they first like kind of like were starting to like reboot the lab up and it's like, hey, you gotta be getting close to the end game and it's, yeah, no, they weren't. Uh, <laughs> um, but over, yeah, overall, I thought it was pretty good. 
it does make me want to check out the original Ant-Man, see, you know, what that was like. Um, I definitely think if you're somebody who likes that sn- kind of snarky, quick, you know, quick-firing Judd Apatow, because it's definitely like Judd Apatow-style humor, um, you'll enjoy this film. Um, I think the action parts, for the most part, really good, very interesting. Like, I, like you said before, I really like the idea of like the kind of the f- combat and action being like kind of like fighting and then sh- shrink, you know, using the suit as you know a tool and a weapon to get things done. Uh, we didn't mention it. I will say this has to be one of the best Stanley cameos ever. That was a hilarious cameo. Yeah, that's uh, true. Um, we didn't mention it, but um, Stan Lee was going to like open his car door, and his car gets shrunk, and he's like, "What? Well, the '60s were fun and all, but man, they're taking you know taking a toll on the mind right now." Whew. You know that 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 was hilarious. It's up there with like the Spider-Man Homecoming uh, cameo that he had. That was hilarious. It's like you know the bus driver. Um, but yeah, no, I I liked it and. Again, I'm. It's making me just look more and more forward to Infinity War too. I really am interested in kind of seeing, though I am like if we've said a million times on here, getting superhero fatigued. They keep doing things and different enough to where I'm like, I kind of want to see what's you know. Yeah. I kind of want to see what's going on. Like so, when Infinity War two comes around, I'm, gonna, I'm really interested in seeing what the end game is and how they plan on moving forward yeah. for the Marvel franchise as a whole. Because you know good and damn well they're not just going to let it die after that and reboot it. They're going to, you know, if they're smart, which I believe the people running, you know, Marvel and Disney right now are pretty smart and know not to, well, we done with Infinity War. Uh, we're going to reboot this whole thing now yeah. and start from square one. Yeah. You know, it'd be really interesting to see like 40 years of like continuity. And that would be crazy. And I, it'd be crazy, but I think it'd be really cool to see, you know, and yeah. kind of seeing that kind of like how, like, introdu- that way you could also, like, you know, if you got rid of Thor for, like, ten years, you could bring him back, but, like, somebody else playing it, like, at, you know, as we constantly see in comic books, you know, mm-hmm. like, oh, someone else took up the mantle of, you know, this character and, you know. Yeah. 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 So I, I'd give it a seven and a half. It's a really fun film, and I would recommend it. Uh, I'd give it probably an eight. Um, I enjoyed this quite a bit. Probably one of uh, my favorite Marvel films um, that has come out of late. Uh, it's really funny. I really enjoyed that. The sense of humor that it has, uh, especially, and it helps to have Paul Rudd as your main character. Um, but the everything about it really hit for me. Um, the plot I thought was pretty good, though. You're right; it could use a little trimming. Um, I thought that uh, they, Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly have uh, a good uh, connection here. Um, I think all of the secondary characters work really well, and they do add a lot to the, the comedy aspect of the film. But the action is really good, too, and the CGI is very seamless. Uh, so I think that works to the film's advantage because it, it really requires a good CGI um, to get th- everything off the ground that should be happening, uh, especially with the growing and shrinking uh, and... and uh, going to the quantum realm. Um, overall, very entertaining film, pretty much exactly what you would, uh, want from an Ant-Man film. And, uh, I'm very excited to see where the series, not just Ant-Man, but the Marvel series goes from here, uh, especially working towards the second part of infinity war. Um, so very good film. Definitely would recommend it. And like I said, uh, one of my favorites from the Marvel series, uh, of late, uh, up there with Spider-Man Homecoming and Infinity War. All right. Thanks for listening to our Ant-Man and the Wasp episode. Uh, we hope you come back next week because what are we doing next week? Or next time. Uh, I, sh- I keep saying week, but in two weeks. I don't know. When do I do? Um, it's a good question. I hadn't really thought about it too much. Um, oh, I should go back to it. Probably. We probably should do some sort of Jalo film. Uh, but I don't have one off the top of my head, so we'll have to talk about it. And we'll think about it. I'll do Scream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A very, very, uh, sc- Scream. That's right. No, um, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure. So we'll, we'll think about it. We'll talk about it. 
uh, we'll let everybody know before the show. But uh, yeah, right now we had, I don't have a, a specific episode in mind, so we'll have to we'll have to really think about it. Uh, but thank you for listening. We uh, are on pretty much any app that you can think of that has podcasts. We're on it. We're on Google Apps or Go- I'm sorry, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, whatever you think of, and whatever's on your phone to listen to apps to listen to podcasts. We're on it. Um, we're on Facebook, facebook.com slash blood and black rum podcast. We're on Twitter at blood and black rum. Uh, we are, uh, we have a patron page on our Podbean, uh, which is blood and black rum podcast.podbean.com. If you subscribe to our patron page, even just a dollar a month, you get access to all of our episodes a day early, at least, uh, if we get them up in time. So, uh, definitely take advantage of that. And you can also write to us at bloodandblackrumpodcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you think about the show, um, anything you want changed, any uh, movies that you can recommend that you want us to cover, and we'll take a look at that. So thank you for listening. We hope to see you back in two weeks for our new episode with an unannounced movie, and we hope you take care. Take care.